Everything has been focused on learning the basics of the transaction. Someone asked yesterday, I think, is it you? I try to remember who asked. Like, when do we hit a point where we're feeling like we know what we're doing as opposed to just sort of like halfway guessing most of the time or something like that? That's a paraphrase. Um, uh, and, and, and I said, I saw your guys' test results and I know that you're getting it, okay? Even if you don't have it perfect, you're getting the concepts. So to this point, it's been this whole process of journal entries and understanding what debits and credits that are and the different types of accounts. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start moving into more specific types of transactions. So we've learned the general things and now we're gonna get into more specific things. So we're switching, so far everything we've looked at has been a, what you'd call a, a uh, service-based business. Businesses who sell services to people, okay? Um, so now we're gonna get into a retail business. Retail businesses are businesses that sell stuff to people rather than just selling services. Some businesses do both, right? But you know, so on, on, the, on the big end, you could think of like Walmart as one of the biggest retailers in the world or Amazon, uh, one of the biggest retailers in the world. They don't really produce stuff. Instead, they buy it from one party and sell it to another. And then on the small side might be like your mom's business, right? Like, you know, they have a small um, shop. It's still run. Indigo Mountain, anybody ever been there? If you like quirky, weird gift type things, and I don't know, it's just weird up there. Just different sorts of, like, whenever I'm like, I have certain Indigo Mountain. It's hippie stuff. Yeah. Oh, it's been like But they also have like cool games or toys, they used to at least, that were like, so like for my grandkids, if I don't want to get them like a Walmart plastic toy, but they have like a Toys of wood that are nice. And, so there'll be some discounts. All right. Anyway, so you're right. So so retail runs that whole gamut from a small little store run by one family to you know the huge empires of Walmart and Amazon. So this is the operating cycle of a retail business. And if you think about it, this is what all businesses do. They start with cash. They purchase merchandise to sell to other people. Then they sell the merchandise to other people. Then they collect the money owed to them by the other people. And they've got cash again. So you just go cash to cash in a cycle, hopefully more cash, right? If you're running your business in a way that's sustainable, you're making some money. Um, so that's the operating cycle. So there's some differences in the financial statements of merchandising or retail businesses from service-based businesses. Um, so for one thing, the name of the revenue account is usually called sales or sales revenue or merchandise sales or something like that, as opposed to fees earned or, or service revenue or something like that. So it's just a different name for its revenue account, but there's a new expense that we haven't seen before in there and it's called cost of goods sold. I bet with a little imagination and a whole lot of pixie dust you can guess what cost of goods sold is. It's the cost of the goods sold, right? So when you sell stuff to people, you have to buy it. So if her mom's gonna sell you a cool wooden toy, she had to buy it from somewhere or she had to produce it, one or the other. Um, probably she bought it from somewhere because she's not, in, you know, doesn't have a big production facility. So if she pays $5 for this toy and then sells it for, for $12, her cost of goods sold, on that one item would be $5. It's an expense. It's the cost of the stuff you're selling, okay? For most retail businesses, cost of goods sold is, is the single largest expense. Um, uh, right up there with, with human resources, employee pay, which is usually also one of the largest expenses most businesses have. So sales minus the cost of goods sold gives us a number that we call gross profit. Not like disgusting gross, okay? Uh, but like gross meaning, meaning gross usually means like our gross income is our income before taxes, right? And then so gross is like a subtotal before all the other expenses come out. Then we have our operating expenses. Those are all the normal expenses we've already been learning about insurance expense and, and, and uh, salaries and wage expense, all those things. And then our gross profit minus our operating expenses gives us what's called operating income. And then a lot of times there'll be one more step where there's non-operating expenses, things like like uh, taxes, um, um, and then at the bottom of that is net income. 
So recognize when we look at the, the income statement of a merchandising or retail business, it's going to have more detail uh, and, and a few more lines we're not used to. All right, so there's two systems to account for merchandise transactions. We're going to focus on one primarily in this class because it's becoming the norm to do that. So well, the first is called a perpetual inventory system. And this is where each, each transaction is recorded with its inventory account as it happens. Um, as opposed to a periodic system where we don't show changes in our inventory account until the end of the period and then we calculate how much it changed. Okay. So this used to be the way it was done. So like what we would do, I, my mom owned a store when I was a kid. She owned the Mount Grand Market, if any of you have ever been up toward the mountain. Um, and so every fiscal year, she would hand me a notebook, a little spiral bound notebook, and I would have to go out and it'd be like, okay, cans of peas. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'd write down eight cans of peas. And then cans of corn. It really sucks, by the way. That's how a kid wants to spend his time. But you'd have to inventory every item we had then we'd look on our records from last year's inventory. We'd say, so that was the start of the inventory period. We would add in anything we purchased and that would give us, so that'd be our inventory to start with plus anything we purchased during the year gave us our inventory that was available for sale. Then we'd subtract out how much inventory we had at the end of this year and the difference would be the amount we sold. So we would, that's, the periodic system calculates inventory once a year or once a quarter or whatever your, your, your transactional period is. Um, and that was how we did it. But now with the, the, the steep drop in price of things like point of sale systems, so barcode scanning systems, because for a while they were like, you had to be rich to afford one, like your business had to be big enough to afford that big system. Um, now you can get with the point of sale for a couple thousand dollars. So it's very affordable. And so now most move to what's called a perpetual system. So it's all set up so that when I get new products in from my supplier, I just type in 24 cans of peas, scan one of them, it adds those to inventory. Then each time someone buys one and I scan it, it subtracts it from inventory. So I always have a running inventory. That's the perpetual, right? It's ongoing as opposed to through a period. So it's, it's important to know that both are out there. Um, if you continue in accounting beyond accounting two, you'll probably see more of it. If you don't, if you're like, I'm a management major, I just have to take this class because it's required, then probably us focusing on perpetual is plenty for you. Okay. Um, let's see. So inventory is an asset. Okay. This is the stuff that we sell to people. So under a perpetual system, when we purchase something, here they're purchasing it for cash, all we do is we debit inventory and credit cash, okay? If we were in a periodic system, we would debit an account called purchases and credit cash. And like I told you in my mom's store, what we would do is we would say, here's what we had at the beginning, plus all our purchases during the year. That's how we, how we did it. So two different ways of doing it. All right. If we, so, so now let's just shift. I'll try to quit talking about both. Um, and instead we'll just talk about from a perpetual system. If we purchase on account, we debit inventory and we credit accounts payable. Okay. So pretty easy. All inventory is, is an asset. It's stuff that's available to sell. Okay. Now this makes it seem like we just have one big inventory account. If you think about someone like Walmart, Every SKU, you know what SKU is? I forget what it stands for, SKU, barcode, okay, is unique. Now, not every barcode is unique in the sense that some, every product's barcode is unique. So every can of, of this brand of peas will have the same barcode. So I don't know how many SKUs there are, unique barcodes in a Walmart store, but I would guess thousands, right? So there's a subsidiary ledger, I mentioned that term before, an in inventory, for each one of those SKUs because they have to track each one individually. Hard to do if you were doing it with a handbook. Easy to do for computers, right? That's, that's again, another way that technology has changed accounting. It does a lot of the heavy lifting. But for our purposes, just know that when we purchase inventory, we're going to debit inventory and then we'll either credit cash if we pay cash 
our credit accounts payable if we didn't pay cash, if we're going to pay later. Okay. All right. So recognize that when we purchase stuff, a lot of times suppliers will give us discounts. So one of the hard things about this chapter is for each of these transactions, think about it. Any retail store could in one setting be a purchaser buying something from a supplier and in another setting be a seller selling something to a customer. So you have to understand what role you're fulfilling to make the correct journal entry. Am I the purchaser of this transaction or am I the seller in this transaction? And that's something I think a lot of students struggle with until they get used to it. So you just have to say, what role is the business in this transaction? So when you're a purchaser and your supplier offers you a discount, um, uh, you, there's certain ways to record it. Okay, so first I wanna kind of show you, this is how terms are expressed. So this, it'll say, so what'll happen is someone will sell you something and they'll say, I'm gonna sell it to you under these terms. And they would call this 210 net 30. That's what they would call this right here. Two slash 10 and slash 30. What that means is I will give you a 2% discount if you pay within 10 days. Or if you don't pay within 10 days, then you owe me the net or whole amount within 30 days. Those are your choices. So uh, if I sell it to you, you could pay me 98% of the cost of it within 10 days. We'll consider that paid in full or 100% of the cost from 11 days on the 30 days. You'll see 310 at 30. Sometimes you'll see like a 2.5. Sometimes you'll see just a net 30 or a net 60, which means the whole amount's due within 60 days. So just become familiar with what this little annotation means. It's, this is about discounts, okay? Again, so this is kind of like, I'm willing to let you pay me in 30 days, but I want to incentivize you to pay me quicker. So I'll give you a little discount to do that. It's pretty normal in, a, in, in business to do that. All right. So here we go. Assume that Net Solutions places an order from Alpha Technologies on January 5th with terms of 210 net 30, a 2% discount within 10 days, or the whole amount due within 30. In order to pay the invoice on January 15th, the last day of the discount period, Net Solutions borrows $2,940, which is $3,000 minus the discount. With an annual interest rate of 6% and a 360-day year is assumed, the interest on the loan for $2,940 for the remaining 20 days. The credit period is $9.80. I don't know why they're doing all this. So in essence, we would actually come out ahead to borrow it. Um, but here's what I want to get to. So the net savings to net solutions for taking the discount is computed as, as follows. Discount, $60, interest for 20 days at 980. So for them, it was worth it to take it. Don't get too wound up in this. Other than a lot of times in accounting, we have to make financial decisions about what's the best deal. $50 for some people would be like, it's not worth all of the trouble of borrowing it from one person to pay it off, so I'm not going to do it. Um, so I'll give you an example of a, a business I worked with who was a construction business that grew from seven employees to about 100 employees in a, in a four-month period. And they found if they would um, they were buying about, they had a constant accounts payable of about a million dollars. And so they would be paying some of it off, but then building other projects. So it was constant. And so if they could save 2% or 3% on their accounts payable, what's 3% of a million dollars? $30,000. So that would be a $30,000 a year savings if they would just make sure they paid within the discount period. Right, like that's that's enough to fund a couple of part-time workers, right, or maybe one part-time worker, uh, depending on how much your wages are. So this starts to matter when you're a big enough business. Uh, you know, I don't know what Walmart's accounts payable is. It, it's it's got to be insane at any given moment. We could actually pull it up on Yahoo Finance and look. Um, so terms of the purchase are normally indicated on the invoice or bill that a seller sends a buyer. Also, this book. We're going to see this start coming up. They use what's called a 360 day year convention. What that means is there's two different ways, and I don't know why that these books are still doing this. So in the olden days, back before my day, back before computers, okay, it was easiest to just for math assume that every month had 30 days and there were 12 months a year. 
So there was 360 days a year. That just made doing the, the computations a lot easier when you're doing it by hand. Most businesses today, because they have computers doing the work and they think I could get five more days of interest out of somebody uh, in a year, are using a 365 day convention. So to add confusion to us, now we have to understand, wait, is this a 360 day year or is this a 365 day year? Um, we know that all days have, um, don't, all, all years have more than 360 days. Uh, so anyway, so just recognize that they're using 360 days. So there's a little formula uh, that, that when we learn about interest rates that we'll need to know, which is if you're paying interest on something, to calculate the amount of interest you're going to pay is the principal, which is the amount owed, owed, times the rate, which is the interest rate, times time. This will come up a bunch in the near future. Principal times rate times time. That's how you calculate interest. Okay, where principal is the amount owed, the rate is the interest rate, and time is time expressed in years. Um, because the rate is always expressed as an annual rate. So you'll see that as we get into it more. So if we take the discount, this is what it would look like. Our inventory would go up by its cost, $1,940, and our accounts payable to Alpha Technology would go up. Okay, it's a liability, so it increases with a credit. Then when we actually paid it on the 15th, our accounts payable liability will go down with a debit, and our cash will go down. It's a pretty standard transaction for a purchase, okay? Um, let's say we somehow, let's see, if the solution did not pay within the discount period, inventory would be debited for the amount of the mixed discount. So let's say we intended to take the discount and then we didn't, they didn't pay until February 4th. They would debit at 2,940 uh, accounts payable, debit inventory, and credit cash. So the reason we would have to do that is, remember when we made the original transaction, we recorded it this way, inventory going up, accounts payable going up. We were going to pay this much on the 15th, but for whatever reason, we decided we couldn't. This does happen when you intend to take the discount and then you don't get it paid in time. So now you have to pay the full amount. You'd have to show your cash going down by 3,000 and your accounts payable going down by 2,940. So what's the difference? Well, it's that $60 extra of discount you didn't pay. We need to charge that to inventory so the inventory reflects fully what we paid for it, okay? So that's a little confusing, but once you work through, and again, I feel like these concepts seem a little confusing, but once you get working with them, they're not too bad, okay? Like this chapter, I think people, they don't hate as much as they hate as adjusting entries. So it's, it's, it's doable. All right. We also have purchase returns and allowances, right? Sometimes we will return things to our suppliers and say it's defective or it's not what we ordered or whatever. And so all we do when we return things to the supplier is we debit our accounts payable and credit our inventory. So it's just the reverse of purchasing it, okay? Uh, if we've already paid cash, then they would send us a cash discount, right? And we report it that way with cash. So May 24th, we returned $1,000 of the inventory purchased on May 2nd. May 12th, paid for the purchases on May 2nd, less the return discount. So there's our original purchase. Inventory went up by $4,900. Accounts payable went up by $4,900. Then we had a return. So our accounts payable goes down with a debit, and our inventory goes down with a credit. Then when we pay it, we only pay the amount that we still owe, okay? Again, once you do a couple of them, you'd be like, that makes perfect sense. Why would you pay money you didn't owe, right? All right. So now let's switch modes. So all of those that we just went through was us as the purchaser. We're buying it from the supplier. Now we need to look at what transactions will look like when it's us, as the seller, okay? So March 3rd, Net Solutions sells merchandise for $1,800. If it's a cash sale, meaning our customer pays us cash at the moment of the transaction, easy. Cash goes up with a debit, um, and we record 
けですね。はい。We record sales of 1800. Remember, sales is a revenue account. Okay? It's just a different name than the revenue account we've been used to to this point. I like it when they call it sales revenue. I think that clarifies things. I don't know why that's not really necessary. We also have to add to our second transaction. So here's an important piece of information to remember. Every time we sell, It generates two transactions. The first transaction, we have to show the amount we received from customers and record that as revenue, right? What the customer pays us and record that as a revenue. If they didn't pay in cash and they, we told them they could pay us later, then it would be accounts receivable and sales. But it's still be the same thing, okay? I call this the retail transaction. It's, it's the transaction with the customer. The second part of it we have to enter is the fact that our inventory is going down. Why is our inventory going down? Because we just sold stuff to somebody. And we have an expense for that inventory, which is the cost of goods sold. So we have, I call it the, the, the retail transaction and the cost transaction. There's always two transactions in any sale. How much the customer is giving me. And that's also revenue. So my cash or my accounts receivable going up and my revenue going up. And then how much inventory is going out the door and the expense of that inventory, the cost of goods sold and the inventory. Every time we do a sales transaction, four entries, okay, for two, it's like two journal entries. A lot of times they'll do it in a single compound entry, but there'll be four entries happening. So here's, um, let's see. Just a little bit. Okay. So, another thing that we have,、um, we have other expenses、uh, that come as being a retailer. A big one for a lot of retailers is our credit card expense. right? We have to pay credit card companies. Think about how credit cards work. Maybe I don't want to offer uh, uh, credit terms to people because some people don't pay me or because. I'd like to get my money right away or whatever. So, what I can do is I can accept credit cards. With a credit card, now each consumer, each buyer goes out and creates a relationship with their own lender. Okay. And that lender says, you can buy up to this much. If you pay us within 30 days, there's no additional cost to you. If, if you want to carry it longer, you can we'll, we'll charge you interest. So, now as the seller, I can get paid usually within two to three days. When somebody pays with a credit card,、um, I'm going to have to pay a small fee to the credit card company, usually something like around 2% of the transaction,、um, plus some sort of a monthly fee of like 50 bucks. That's pretty normal.、Um, so that's what, what businesses pay. They'll pay like $50 a month plus 2% of each transaction. Okay. So it lets me get my money quicker. It lets my customer get stuff and maybe they won't have money right away if they need it. And so it's kind of a win win. And then the guy in the middle, Makes money on the interest and then those transaction fees. And so it's a win win win. That's how people see it. Okay. So just, just recognize that usually at the end of each month, a retailer is going to have some type of credit card expense. Okay.、Uh, you, just, you just get a statement from your supplier,、uh, or not your supplier, but your credit card company, your processing company saying this is how much your fees were withheld this month. All right. If we make sales on account, Going to look a lot like the sales we just had on, in cash, except now instead of debiting cash, we debit accounts receivable and credit sales revenue. And then we also debit cost of goods sold and credit sales inventory. So let me ask you a knowledge check. What would you say is the gross profit of this transaction? Do you remember what gross profit was? Where'd you get that? Between what? The, the cost of the sales. Yeah. So each of the sales, what we sold to the customer for, the revenue account, minus the cost of goods sold is our gross profit. So on this transaction, they had a revenue of $18,000 and a cost of goods sold expense of 
So the difference is 7,200. That was their gross profit on that transaction. Not their net income because their net income covers all those other expenses. If you think about it, if a business were to have a gross profit equal to its operating expenses, we'd say that business was at a break even point. They had brought in just enough after cost of goods sold to cover all of their expenses. That cost of goods sold is a special expense we call a variable expense because it, it, it's tied to your sales volume. The more you sell, the more your cost of goods sold will be. Whereas things like your rent expense or your insurance expense, those are fixed expenses. If you sell one item, you still pay $1,000 a month in rent. If you sell 10,000 items, you still sell, pay $1,000 a month in rent. It doesn't change. So our goal is to set our prices so that we can make enough gross profit, right? Which is our revenue minus our variable expense of cost of goods sold to cover those fixed expenses and make the amount of profit we need to make to, to be successful. And that's what we're doing. But if you think about it, like business, they have all these, like we give you degrees in and everything. And honestly, at the end of the day, it comes down to, are you making, are you bringing in more than your expenses? That's it. Now there's lots of ways for us to try to do that. But honestly, that's all that, sometimes I'll meet people, I'll help them with their business and they'll be like, I don't even care if I make a profit. I just want to help the world. And you're like, that's adorable. But you've got to at least make enough to cover expenses or you can't really help the world. But you don't have to be, you don't have to get rich. You know, I see lots of nonprofits that run at break even, but they at least have to cover their expenses or this great thing they're doing for the world that can't be sustained, right? So you got to, you know, I'm not talking about evil, filthy capitalism. I'm talking about making enough to sustain a business so that you can continue to, to provide the goods and services that are meaningful to you. I run a soccer league, right? We have to make enough to cover our costs so that we can keep providing soccer for kids. We don't have to get rich. Nobody's getting rich. We're all volunteers, right? But we have to make enough. All right. So remember we had purchase discounts where we were the purchaser. There's also sales discounts. So now as the seller, we offer discounts to people. Again, if you think about that transactionally, it's going to be recorded differently because in the one case we're the purchaser, here we're the seller. So a seller can offer credit terms just like a purchaser. Um, and so it's the same nomenclature, okay, 210 net 30, which is probably the most common, by the way, that's why they keep showing it, probably the most common discount. So assume net solution sold $18,000 of merchandise to digital technologies on March 10th with credit terms of 210 net 30. The March 10th sale will be recorded as follows. So this business is using, there, there's sort of two ways of thinking about this, okay? Some businesses assume everybody's going to take the discount. So what they do is they go ahead and record all of their sales as if the customer is going to pay them within the discount period. And then if the customer doesn't take the discount, they do an adjusting entry to show that they got the whole amount instead of the discounted amount. Other businesses take the other strategy, which is to assume nobody's going to take the discount. And then if the customer does pay within the discount period, they do an adjusting entry to show that they gave the discount. Okay. Really what dictates this is how often do people take the discount, right? What's in other words, is it, is it more normal in your business for people to pay the full price or to do the discount amount? And that will usually dictate how you enter these transactions. Either way it's legal from a generally accepted accounting principle standpoint. They're just both based on an assumption. Okay. Um, all that matters is when we actually do get paid, it all has to come out right so we can adjust for that. All right. So this method that was what I was just describing, the sale to digital technologies is recorded by Net Solutions at the most likely amount expected to be received. So their experience tells them their customers take the discount. Okay. So they go ahead and record it. So this method of recording sales discounts is called the net method, meaning we record it at what we, th we think we're going to receive, the net amount, okay? You'll see others that do it at the gross method where they just assume nobody takes it, okay? So when they actually pay it, or actually get paid for it, I should say, their cash goes up, their accounts receivable goes down. So when you'll see when they actually get paid, there's no revenue entry, right? Because we did the revenue entry all the way back when we sold the merchandise to them. 
Because remember, we record revenue when we earn it. So when I sell it to you, I've earned it. Okay. All right. If digital technologies does not pay within the discount period, so they send us eighteen thousand dollars in cash, we'll record our accounts receivable as the amount that was owed to us from what we recorded, and then the additional three hundred and sixty we'll have to record as additional revenue. Okay. So that's the adjustment, so to speak, when they get paid the full amount instead of the discounted amount. All right. We also have refunds that we have to pay to customers. So typically what we do, so let's just, I'll just read through their little example here. Foreman Enterprises return merchandise with a selling price of $3,000 for a cash refund. The merchandise originally cost net solution $2,100. So when we get a return, remember when we made a sale, we had to record two entries, one for our cost and the other for the amount of revenue we're getting from the customer. So if we do a return or a refund, we have to do two entries again to show that our inventory is going up by the cost of the inventory and that our, our, our refund payable and our cash are going by, by the amount of the refund, okay? Again, this sounds complicated when you get into it, you'll work through it pretty easy. Let's see. So here's just some samples of journal entries to record refunds. So if the customer doesn't return merchandise, some, that's called an allowance in a lot of businesses. Customers will kind of say, hey, this is broken. And instead of saying, send it back so that we can deal with it, we write, just keep it and we'll send you a refund. That happens a lot, okay? Uh, you probably had some transaction on Amazon like that, where you, you, you've written to them and said, I want to return it. And they're just like, no, we don't want to have to deal with the cost of dealing with a broken thing. So, send you money. so anyway, so these are just some samples. These are in the book of, of the various types of entries you'll see with these, um, which ones we just went through in the examples, but I just like to summarize them. All right, another new concept. So we're on our third new concept, right? Sales. So we have, we have purchaser concepts, seller concepts, and now freight terms. So when I buy stuff from somebody as a purchaser or I sell stuff to somebody, there's always this question of like, how's the stuff gonna get to them, right? Sometimes it's easy. I, you know, they drove to my store, they bought it and they pick it up and they leave. Other times we have to ship it. So these terms get used um, not only in this chapter, but in real life. And there, these are FOB, shipping point, and FOB destination. FOB uh, sounds like it could be like someone you don't like, they're a real FOB, um, uh, but that's not what it means. Uh, it means freight on board, okay? And so what it really means is once the freight, the stuff that you're shipping gets loaded on board the truck, the freight is on board, okay? So we can have FOB shipping point, which means as soon as the seller loads the goods on the, to, the, to the truck to sell, to send them to the buyer, the title or ownership passes to the buyer as soon as they're loaded on the truck. With FOB destination, the title or ownership of the goods remain the sellers all the way till the truck arrives at the buyer's location. This matters for a couple of reasons. First of all, it matters from an accounting standpoint as to when do I take this inventory, if I'm the seller, out of my inventory and record it as a sale, right? Do I do it at the time I load it on the truck here or do I have to wait until they accept it at the other end? It also matters in legal proceedings for things like what happens if the, the truck gets in a crash along the way? Who has to deal with it? Was it my stuff or was it the buyer's stuff? So. That's why it's important when you're filling out the paperwork or making a deal with somebody to understand the freight terms. Who owns it when and where? Yeah. What would be more often to rely on? Uh, shipping point is probably the most common. Um, I don't know. Maybe not. I was thinking in terms of like business to business transactions, but then I started thinking of like, like I'm pretty sure every Amazon transaction is destination based. Right, like I don't consider that I own it till I get it, and they take responsibility if it never gets to me. So probably I, I take it back. Probably if we start to consider the, the the sheer volume of consumer transactions that now occur via 
common shippers like UPS and USPS and FedEx, it's probably destination because, man, uh, did anybody buy anything from Amazon this week? A couple of us, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's that common, right? It's all the time. My son, recently, he's like, Dad, he's a, he's a senior in high school. Dad, check this out. He like pulls out like, like Lord Voldemort's wand. I love this. I'm like, why? It's dope. Okay. And then the next day, this another box arrives, and I'm like, what is that? The Elder Wand? And like, pretty soon he's got like all these wands. I'm like, you spent like $300 on wands. He's like, I know, it's awesome, right? And I'm just like, what? <laughs> all right. Whatever. I don't know why. He's got like a whole collection of wands. Uh, so probably don't go mess with him because he will be put some kind of curse on you. All right. <laughs> So just to recognize the difference between FOB shipping point and uh, FOB destination. Also recognize this, when the buyer pays for the freight, they just lump in the cost of freight as the part of their inventory cost, because it's the cost of the stuff they're buying, right? So not only what they paid the seller, but also the cost of freight. So their transaction is inventory increases by the total cost, in cash or accounts payable uh, on the other side of it. When the seller pays for freight, it's pretty normal for them to record delivery expense as a separate expense. It's a little confusing. So again, another reason to have to say to yourself, am I the buyer or the seller in this transaction? And who's paying for the freight? If I'm the buyer and I'm paying for the freight, I need to record, add that freight into my inventory cost. If I'm the seller and I'm paying for freight, I'm usually going to record this as an expense separate from my cost of goods sold. Um, and anyway, so just recognize that's pretty normal too. Again, here's just a summary. I won't read them to you, but of, of inventory transactions, how they're debited or credited. All right, sales taxes. In Arizona, we don't have sales tax because our Arizona constitution doesn't allow for sales tax. Instead, we have transaction privilege tax, which smells a lot like a sales tax, but apparently there's something enough different about it that it, 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 it's allowed. So I'm assuming what that means is like the county you're selling stuff is, is like, hey, it's a privilege to do business in our county. So we're gonna have you pay a transaction tax for that privilege, okay. And then I'm just call it sales tax. So I'll be all know what you're talking about, okay. So in the state of Arizona, transaction privilege tax, every month uh, sellers have to fill out a tax return. It's called a TPT-1, uh, which is the name of the form. And it just says, this is how much stuff I sold. This is how much of it was exempt from sales tax, which means this is the amount that was taxable. So here's an interesting thing about the way sales tax works. The seller, becomes an agent, so to speak, for the government, meaning they collect the tax from the buyer and then they have to remit that tax to the government, uh, usually on a monthly basis. Some places it's quarterly, but in Arizona it's monthly, okay? So uh, the liability, so what happens is when I sell this and I collect this money, I record it on my books as a liability because I owe that money to the government, okay? so. I want to show my cash going up, but not all that cash is mine, right? So only the cash for the sale is mine, the cash for the taxes. I want to record a, a corresponding liability so that I know I need to pay this to the, to the state. All right. So the seller would record a sale of $100 on account subject to a tax of 6% as follows. So the amount the customer owes them, accounts receivable, is $106. Record sales revenue of 100, record sales tax payable of $6. Okay, at the end of the month, when they pay it, then they'll show sales tax, they'll, they'll debit sales tax payable and credit cash because they'll be paying, uh, sending a check to the government. So, how does it they don't have enough money to pay off their sales tax payable? Um, then you better get really flexible so you can kiss your butt goodbye because the, 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 the Department of Revenue will not love the idea that you collected sales tax from customers and then 
didn't pay it to them. Does that make sense? Yeah. So usually, like if if it's like a one-time deal, you can work out a deal and they'll let you like pay it over you know the next six months or something. But if if you're, if you're a habitual, habitually behind on transaction privilege tax, they'll shut you down. Because if you think about it, it's a kind of theft to say to the customer, "I need you to give me six percent," and then say to the state, "Oh, my bad, I, uh, I." Uh, there was these, there was, there was this crazy thing. There was this really sweet Corvette and, or whatever. It's not really that. It's usually most business owners are just really stretching to make ends meet. So some businesses actually keep a savings account and they just, you know, they, they, they move that sales tax over into that account. So they know they have enough um, at the end of the, of the period. And that's why most states have gone to monthly paying. You're less likely to get behind and not be able to pay if you have to pay it every month. Than if they were like, just pay us the sales tax for the whole year at the end of the year, right? Yeah, you think of your own financial handling. Monthly bills are easier to cover than once a year bills. You have to make a plan for those. Um, so again, on a regular basis, the seller pays the taxing authority, usually the state. In Arizona, even though you're paying county and city sales tax as well as state tax, the state actually handles it all. So you send in one form to the state for the amount that you collected. And then the state distributes it back to the counties and cities. Um, that's how they do it here. So here's what the adjusted trial balance of a merchandising business will look like. It's a lot like the adjusted trial balance of all the others we've seen, except it's going to have an inventory account, which we didn't have before. That's an asset. Uh, it's going to have things like estimated returns. It's going to have down in the expenses. It's going to have, what's that? cost of goods sold, right? So it's just going to have those additional accounts that we didn't have before. And every other way, it'll be the same. Multiple step income statement is something that's going to be new-ish. You've seen income statements before. The multiple steps are just going to have these additional lines. It's going to have sales revenue, like I mentioned before, cost of goods sold for new expense, gross profit, which is the difference between the revenue and the cost of goods sold, and then operating income and these other revenues and expenses. So here's an example of one. We have sales, less cost of goods sold, gives us gross profit. Man, you can see what a big chunk of their sales, their cost of goods sold is, right? I mean, that's five over seven, almost 70%. Then they're gonna have their operating expenses and they often have them broken down into selling expenses, the cost of selling stuff, and administrative expenses, the cost of administrating the business. With your total operating expenses. So our operating income is just our gross profit minus our operating expenses. Other revenue and expense, things like rent revenue, interest expense. Um, just so you like, so think if you're like Walmart and you've got like a storage or something up back and you rent it to some of your suppliers so they can just keep stuff in there. That's not part of your normal operations. You're in the business of selling stuff. That's why they record it down here as an other revenue. That's not part of their regular revenue scheme. And I think that's plenty for one day. So the, the challenge of this chapter is a lot of new concepts, but the, the, the easy side of it is none of them are too hard once you kind of just practice with them a little bit. Okay. So that's good.